Ruin, in particular, we'll go back. Ruin is a, a romantic commonplace, of course, actually. Ruins for the generation. Turner is born in 1775. Yes, that's worth, actually, a comment on, because we, we have actually no document that proves Turner's birthday. But Turner said, and, you know, in... in uh, since we don't have any document that contradicts it either, we know he's born in 1775, but Turner tells us he was born on April the 23rd, 1775. Anybody who's not British here know what's celebrated on April the 23rd in Britain? Britons do not, do not count. Who is it? Absolutely. God, you're also so damn transatlantic. It's fantastic. Indeed. St. George's Day and Shakespeare's birthday. So um, <laughs> if Turner is making up, there was a particular point where he settled on, on, on that particular day. Ruins in the end of the 18th century, when antiquarian books are being published over and over again, for example, the first great, um, first great books on the history of British costume are being published in the 1780s and 1790s. Samuel Meyrick's antiquarian compendia about the history of British armor. This is the moment when those ancient suits of armor from the late Middle Ages, the Renaissance and 17th century, if they survived, are being taken out from, from collapsing barns in the middle of Wiltshire and Northamptonshire and cleaned up and stuck in the front of the manorial front hall. The sense in which actually ruin had actually something to say about what it meant to be British. Um, some of you, because um, you're such a learned bunch, will know Linda Colley's wonderful book called Britons, which makes the point that before the middle and the end of the 18th century, the notion of being British was barely recognized at all. You were English, or you're Welsh, or you're Scots, or you're Irish. But the effect, very important to Turner, as we'll see in a minute, of the relentless wars against the French had created something which superseded those separate sub-national identities into something called British. And there was a, a hunt really underway for a sense of what the kind of shared history of Britishness could possibly mean. Ruins then often held the key to those mysteries. The mysteries and histories were sometimes histories of conflict and and slaughter, but they nonetheless were a kind of shared experience about those um, who cohabited the British Isles, Albion itself. Um, so Turner, the young Turner, of course, um, born very near Covent Garden in Maiden Lane, father a wig maker, born, as we said, and not insignificant, that date of 1775, by the way. 1775, also the date of uh, of Concord and Lexington Green, the sense in which actually a huge part of present British history, namely the American Empire, was disappearing. So it was a sort of cultural recoil once Britain had lost the American colonies, back to, back to the territorial nature of what its own memory could be. Here's a very early Turner, um, which represents the morning after the fire at the Pantheon, which is a theater in Oxford Street, where Turner, at the age of 16, had been hired to do painted backdrops. Um, a lot of artists um, who were not necessarily high artists in the history painting or portraiture mode of Sir Joshua Reynolds, for example, and who were... Uh, I, they might have been um, members of the Royal Academy, but they might have not, had to do kind of job work. They colored in prints, um, they did topographical views, and it seemed likely that the young, very precociously gifted Turner would have to uh, do all those different kinds of, have lots of those strings to their bow if he was really going to uh, make a living. So here he is actually um, at, on scene uh, with the smoldering ruins of a place that had specialized, that had really made painting a part of the theatrical entertainment, moving backdrops. The uh, Anglo-Swiss artist Lutherburg was very famous for doing catastrophe avalanches, disasters, which um, thrilled the folks in the stalls. Um, it was even better when actually the catastrophe turned into your own calamity as you fled from the stalls as the smell of smoke reached your nostrils. Um, the British love disaster paintings, actually. We're going to look, and you'll see, some of you have seen upstairs, the burning of the houses of Lords and Commons. That was the most single painted subject in all of 19th century British art. Um, British have taste for, um, you know, the, the, f the happy frisson of calamity, really. <laughs> we may be getting something of that ourselves, I guess, actually, yeah. Um, so he went on, his first teachers were uh, 
two people called Thomas Moulton and John Hardwick. Thomas Moulton, in particular, was an architectural um, artist, and uh, uh, the, the teenage turner, this is a teenage turner of a view of Lambeth Palace, the sort of thing that would make, give him a living. He was, even when he was 10, he was hand coloring in um, images from Francis Gross's, a pirated copy of Francis Gross's Antiquities of Great Britain and Ireland. He was paid tuppence a coloring for that, which wasn't actually bad if you were simply the wig maker's son running around like an urchin um, around St. Paul's Piazza and Maiden Lane. But it was clear that he actually had some sort of talent, but a very kind of conventional orthodox talent combining a little genre painting with um, a view a view of the um, Archbishop of Canterbury's London residence of, of Lambeth Palace. Another kind of job work which would have been absolutely imperative to do if he wanted simply to be this rather artisanal figure doing this rather down market work would have been actually doing topographical prints of the country estates of the British gentry. The British gentry and aristocracy, after all, own the British constitution. They are those who are the dominant class in both politics and society. And this is a view of uh, Radley Hall that Turner, the, the teenage Turner does as well. Um, I think he was sort of 16 and 17 when he does this. But you can see, above all, it almost looks like you know, a greetings card that's going to be produced by the aristocratic patron. Um, it, it, it almost looks like a kind of, even while the architectural drawing is, is, is absolutely accurate, these huge sort of flanking trees, which may or may not have been there, probably almost certainly not, suggests that what is meant, what is really wanted in this commission is a sort of um, a, a gentle aristocratic boast. It's an ingratiation that Turner really has to... Um, has to perform here. Uh, remember that the, uh, the interior of these kind of country estates were full of paintings themselves that reflected pastoral scenes, and then a meaning of the word picturesque, very popular in the 1780s and 90s, was that you went outside and built your park as a combination of tame and wildness that actually was an extension of the pictures that you were hanging in your own private gallery. So the sense that there is a kind of indoor-outdoor conspiracy in a kind of genteel fantasy of those who are the dominant class in Britain is, is pretty much the kind of job which the young Turner was, was hired to do. But, but, even still as a teenager and before he becomes... Um, and he becomes an apprentice very early on in the Royal Academy, and that was the really only way it would be possible to actually make uh, your way. But as an apprentice, you were one of a, younger of, uh, of a number of uh, much younger artists who all were hoping to kind of break through the crucial barrier to become an associate of the Royal Academy, which meant that you were, you were a sort of provisional fellow, and Turner became associate um, at the tender age of 25 in, in 1800. The period between, though, the period, obviously, a breakout from the kind of very tame and demure, if, if Turner had been doing Radley Halls and Lambeth Palaces, we all wouldn't be sitting here, there wouldn't have been an exhibition, we would be sitting here thinking about his career. But the other thing that the young Turner does, of course, was go on a tramping tour to the West Country. He had relatives in near Bristol. Uh, he was sent there by his father. Um, it was often the case that this was done because London became an unwholesome and unhealthy place to be. Turner went, as he tells us, and Joseph Farrington and Walter Thornbury, his rather unreliable biographer. But we do know that he went tramping as a walker. This is the first time in the 1790s when um, walking was thought to be not a completely unhinged form of uh, locomotion. You actually went walking. Think of Wordsworth and Coleridge, and you had in your little backpack your coloring and your lump of cheese. Um, and Turner did exactly that and lay down and painted skies and was famous for doing um, prolific sky pictures, which Turner later in life himself said he also sold to the public as a means of uh, boosting his income. But above all, Turner went, again like Wordsworth, and often to the same places, to commune with ruins that whispered to him of the ghosts of the British past. 